what was the church at that time, the Jewish church, uh, saying what it meant to follow God was actually a path away from him. His words were crystal clear, no clouded parable, no obscure symbolism, instead a straightforward announcement that the world had, be had better upside down itself fast. The message was called the Beatitudes. And though we praise it in modern Christianity, we don't seem to be paying much attention to its theology. 
The thinking of the day was that affluence and influence insinuated an individual was more blessed of God. And we kind of look at that this way now, don't we? The Pharisees were seen as the holiest because they they knew the most and owned the most, a sentiment that resounds even more loudly in our modern church. Jesus blew that thinking away with the very first words of his mouth in his very first recorded, recorded sermon he gave. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees believed they were ultimate, the ultimate in religion. Now, just like any passage in scripture, we in the church tend to make of this whatever we want it to mean. We say it refers to the humble or to those who have much but give the credit freely to God. We say it refers to those who have given up much willingly for God. It might mean that a little, but what it certainly means as well is that those who are downtrodden at the end, at the very end of who they are, beat up and given up. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not only that they might, not only that they might just receive the crumbs, but it is primarily theirs. Why? We've all reached this point on some level that God has ripped every good thing away from us to make us wish we had never crossed Him. But the opposite is actually true. It is only at the end of ourselves that we truly surrender the need to comprehend what the bonus of faith will deliver for us. We are too often in the race for heaven for ourselves, but that doesn't happen at the end of ourselves. At the end of ourselves, when we find we have nothing left but God's grace, a funny thing happens. We stop wanting more, we stop wanting more than God's grace. We suddenly uncover the reality that His grace is not only enough stuff, but it's actually the only stuff that matters. When God's grace becomes the only thing that matter in our perspective, all other stuff falls into place. Christian relationships become richer and more selfless. Our efforts within a church structure become valuable and life-giving internally and externally. A lot of people live this way on top of themselves. The problem is that it sits even Stephen on the teeter-totter with a faith in himself. That's when Jesus came to knock off. This is when he gave the Beatitudes beginning with the poor in spirit and the other Beatitudes. It is our role to lead people to Jesus. Only Jesus can draw men's hearts and minds to him. And here's that paragraph again. What am I trying to show you in a few words? Look and think about these Beatitudes as you take communion and ask yourself, am I thinking and doing it the way he wanted, doing it as he would want me to be humble, grateful, adoring him because he, not us, is a master of the universe. Let's approach this communion today with a thankfulness, humbleness, and reverence for the gift he has given us. <laughs> Prayer, Heavenly Father, we are so blessed that we are able to gather as believers and come to your table. I pray that we all come to your table today with a, with a reverent heart and a humble heart. We know that you died for our transgressions. We know what it means to come to your table. And we know the feeling that we have as we take communion. I pray that we take this feeling, not just now, but as we go out to the world and try to feel what we feel right now 24-7 so we can understand that what you did for our salvation and that others that may not believe can understand what you can also do for them. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.
bow our heads in prayer. At least, Father, we are so grateful. When you bring us the sun in the morning, the moon at night, you bring forth bread from the earth. You put clothes on our back and shelter over our heads. Sometimes we overlook this, Lord, and all these come from you. We thank you, Lord. Today we give up just a portion back, which doesn't seem like it's enough. We thank you, Lord, for, that we're able to give you the first fruits of our labor, that we're able to make and make a living. Take this offering, Lord. We ask you to bless it. Bless it in Jesus' name that we pray. Yeah. 
In Mark chapter 10, we're going to be at verses 46 through 52. And in Luke, chapter 18, we're going to be at verse 35 to the end. So. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52, reads like this. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and His disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling for you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Then in Luke, Luke chapter 18, verse 35, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw this, they also praised God. I had to read that second part to show that uh, it wasn't just that man, but others who also praised him. And uh, it's kind of an interesting story. If you go back to Mark, chapter 10, just prior to this story, there are two of his disciples who asked Jesus a question. And in that question, Jesus phrases the words again, what do you want me to do for you? And it was James and John, and James and John, and what did James and John want? I want a son on the left and him on the right. And Jesus said, well, those aren't places I can give out. You know? His answer to them in essence was, no. Here in the blind man story, the answer was yes. And we, we find in life that we get no's from God, and we get yeses from God, and we've got waits from God. And we have to understand that, that when we ask of God something, He's faithful to do it. But according to His will, yes, no, wait. Kind of thing. In this story, the interesting part of the story is the blind man and his request. Jesus says, what can I do for you? And the blind man says, I want to see. Here's what the blind man said. I want to be whole. Now to understand that, you have to go back into their culture and understand their time. Who was the man talking? Artemis. What was his problem? He was blind. He had resolved himself to being blind. What was he? A beggar. He would sit on the streets or on the steps of, of the, of the uh, temple and he would beg. And he was used to that life. He was used to doing what he did. In the morning he would get up and go to a place that he knew and he would beg. It's no different than, than some of the, the homeless that we see or people that stand out here at the exit of the interstate with their signs, uh, we'll work for food, um, veteran, please help, um, all kinds of different things that they would say on them. And, and some of them really wanted help. Some of them just wanted what they wanted. And I can tell you that because 
pulled up there one time and, and I have a large yard and I thought, we'll work for food? Come on, we'll go over here and, and I got some yard work you can do and I'll pay you and get you, we'll come down here and get some food. And the man's response was, how much are you going to pay? And I said, what, 10 bucks an hour? That's a good going wage. I give you 10 bucks an hour to do the lawn yard. And he goes, you've got to be kidding me. I said, see ya. Well, and he says, do you know how much I can make standing here in an hour? It wasn't worth the 10 bucks. He really didn't want to work. He wanted the money, you know, to do what he could do. So, so it was like, okay, and I just drove on. And because I didn't help him, because I just drove on, I, I got a nice gesture from the man. I think he said I was number one. I'm not quite sure. But uh, on another occasion, there was a man out here begging at the corner, and the news press did a story on him. And the story is he would beg on this corner, but he drove a BMW and owned a big house over here in Alva, and he made more money working there than he would working a job. And I don't know if you remember that, about eight, nine years ago, the news press did a story on the man showing where he lived and something like this, and here's what, you know. And that, that hurts those who are standing there who really want to be helped. See, and here Artemis wanted help. He said, Son of David. Do you understand that phrase? What was he saying when he said, Son of David? Jesus. He's saying Messiah. He knew who Jesus was. He's saying Messiah, the, the proclaimed one to come. Messiah, have mercy on me. Now what he was asking was no small task. You see, because he's used to that life. He's used to begging on the corner. He's used to getting what he gets and going about his business. If he gets his sight... All of life changes. He no longer can beg on the corner. He has to find a new way of living. He can no longer beg, so he's going to have to get a job. He's going to have to do something now that he's not used to doing. But he's going to have to do it. When he said, Lord, I want to see, what he was saying was, remake my life. Make me new. Make, make me something I'm not. Any of you ever say that? That was, that was Artemis' come to Jesus moment. That, that was his instance that he was like, here. Take this, this thing that I am, and make me like you. I don't know about you, but I know that when I walked an aisle and I came to a realization of who Jesus was and, and I decided to accept Him as my Lord and Savior, I should have had a come to Jesus moment. I should have said, Lord, here I am, mold me and make me. In essence, that's what I did. And I tell you the story all the time. You remember the first day, that Sunday, how was I? Bring it. Come on, devil. I'm the man now. And on Monday, <laughs> hey, did we hear that you got baptized Sunday? Ah, oh, yeah. Family was all doing it. And, and I'm, I'm going to tell you this, and I'm not proud of this fact, but that was seventh grade. And eighth grade. And ninth grade. And it wasn't until three-fourths way through my ninth grade year that I realized being in church choir and playing on the church softball team and playing on the church basketball team and playing church dartball and, and bowling league and everything that they had going, being involved in all that, being around church people, listening to them talk, then I realized I'm supposed to be different. I'm not any different than I was that day. I, I remember... Youth Minister Dan Craig saying, 
Well, some people go in the water a sinner and come out a wet sinner. <laughs> they never let it change them. And there's nothing miraculous about the water. The miraculous part is Jesus. That Jesus that we see here walking down the road that a man screaming out for Him and He notices the voice and all the crowd. Trust me. He's in a group of people. He's in a crowd of people. Read what it says. He came into town and the apostles were with Him and a crowd of people and, and there's noise all around. And in all that noise, He picked out Barnabas' voice. Not a mistake. Not by accident. Jesus did it to make a point. And in Luke, we see the point. All the people then praised Him. That's what it was about. It wasn't about just doing a miracle. It was about Jesus showing and proving to them Him. You know who Him is? The I Am? The Almighty? The One and Only? Jesus, God. The Holy Spirit, three and one. It's Him. It's Him who can change me from a sinner to a saint. You know anyone else in life that can do that? Is there anyone else in, in, in the world that, that can change you to, the, to be what God would have you to be? No. Oh, they claim Muhammad, and they'll claim Buddha, and they'll claim John Smith, and they'll claim all these other people. Okay? There's no one. If it comes up to a toe-to-toe -to -toe battle, everyone else fails. Why? They can't raise from the dead. None of the other ones can raise from the dead. None of the other ones can make the claims that He made. I am the Son of God, and I now sit where? Right hand of the Father. He's there. He's the man that can change this life. Our man do this. When he asked for sight, he, what he was asking was to be made whole. To change my life. Oh, it's going to change his life. He's not going to sit on the steps no more. He's going to have to go work. He's going to have to become a part of society. He's going to have to do those things. But do it how? He was changed and he what? Followed Jesus. Now, he physically followed Jesus. But do you think he followed Jesus? That one who gave him his sight back? I bet when someone down the road, when, when Jesus is gone and they're talking about it, I bet Bartimaeus is like, hey, let me tell you who he is. Look at these, look at these babies. And I just imagine, I don't know why I do this, but in my mind, he had baby blue eyes. <laughs> Something that drew me in. You know those blue eyes that just draw you in? You know, nobody on this side of the room has those, do you? They're kind of bloody. Kind of bloody. No. <laughs> but they draw you in. They're, they're, they're bright blue. He had, I'm thinking he had those. That people were drawn and noticed him. Oh, have you? I got these from Jesus. Anyone else say that? And he changed his life that day forever. I guarantee you, Barnabas is not going to be the same. He asked for mercy, and he got what? Mercy plus. mercy plus. What did he get? Grace. Grace. He didn't. He didn't just get mercy. He got grace. <coughs> what does mercy and grace get you? No way. That's what he got that day. And that story, when you read it, that's what he got. It wasn't the story before, where James and John and Jesus said, "What can I do for you?" Oh yeah, we want to sit at your right hand, left hand. Jesus says right there, they don't understand. They don't understand that I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die for them. I'm going to be flanked on either side by thieves. One who will mock me, curse me, and one who will call my name. He says they don't understand what I'm about to do for them. 
And there's one thing Jesus couldn't do in his life. He couldn't give them the left and the right. He says those will go to those who it is prepared for. Who is that? Who gets left and right? Who? Us. Us. James and John were asking, and Jesus says, no, that's, that's prepared for those. That's us. Who's us? Those who cry out for mercy and grace. Those who understand and realize who Jesus is. Those who walk an aisle, go somewhere and, and proclaim, I believe, Jesus Christ the Son of the living God. And I accept Him as my Lord and my Savior. Artemis is Lord, gave Him vision. The Savior gave Him eternal life. And that's what we're after, is it not? Isn't that what we want? I mean, this is such a simple story. This is a beggar sitting on the steps and Jesus walks by, but look at what it pertains to. Now the question today is posed there. It's posed in the story just before it. The request of James and John, what would you have me do for you? It's posed here in the story, what would you have me do for you? It's also in, in, in Luke, what would you have me do for you? And so the question today is this. If Jesus were standing right here and He said those words to you, what would you have me do for you? This is the King of Kings. This is the Lord of Lords. This is Jesus. And He stands here and He says, Ah, what would He do for you today? You see, the same story is told that famous preacher and, and he saw a blind kid. And he was doing this, this type of sermon and he said to the blind kid, he said, if Jesus asked you today, what would you want? The boy's reply was this, I'd want a dog with a leash that could leave me. What did the boy want? He wanted, kind of wanted the easy way, didn't he? If I get sight and I get this, life's going to change. But if I just get a dog, leave me. How many of you are being led through this life by a dog? Satan's been called all kinds of things, but today he's a dog. How many of you are being led through this life by a dog? How many of you will answer that question. What do you want me to do for you different? How many of you would want to be made whole? You know what whole means, don't you? Complete. It's in Sunday school. We're talking about giving, serving, sharing for Him. It's about what difference can I make in this world here for eternity? How can I do something that is that significant? It's that answer. I want my sight. I want my sight. I want to be able to see what God has in store for me. I want to be able to see what Jesus wants for me. I want to be able to answer that question. What would you have me do today? Show me what you want from my life. That would be my answer. Show me exactly what you want. I think I'm living it kind of a... I know there's more I can do, so show me that I can follow. Here's the problem. Here's my question to you. Jesus' question would be this. What would you have me do for you? My question is this. If He did, would you do it? See, because the question he's asking here is already answered, isn't it? What do you want from Jesus? What does he have to do to prove to you who he is and what he wants? 
See, for some of us, being beaten through the streets wasn't enough. Flogged wasn't enough. To hang on the cross wasn't enough. If it was, our faith would show. So he asked the question, what would you have me do for you? What do I, Jesus, need to do for you that you will get it and in return do it? Bartimaeus got it. Bartimaeus got his sight, immediately praised God and followed Jesus. Luke goes a little farther in his story. Immediately he praised God and followed Jesus and the people who saw him likewise then praised God. Praise God why? Because what they saw in Bartimaeus. Now, here it is. Are people praising God for what they see in you? They see you, they meet you, and it causes them to also praise God. I, I praise God every day that Ken said it simply Wednesday night. I got out of bed. That's a praise. God doesn't guarantee you another day of life. To get up in the morning, that's a praise. To be allowed to work for Him and serve Him, that's a praise. To be able to do those things in this life we have, praise. So Bartimaeus got his sight and he begins praising God through his life. I guarantee you it's going to go on beyond the story. Bartimaeus is in that town telling people, you know what happened to me? And because of that, people are praising God. What have you done? What do you do? What is it that when you come in a room, people see and it causes them to praise God? That only happens if answer Jesus' question. It only happens if you answer it and He gives and you praise Him. In other words, it only happens if you are His. And not just Sunday morning, not, not when it's convenient, 24-7, 365, you're His. No matter what struggles, no matter what problems, no matter what has dealt you in life, you're His. And you work through it. And you overcome it. And you become what He wants you to be. That's what Bartimaeus did. That's what the story is. He overcame his blindness to be the man with sight that can go and do Jesus. So this morning, what would you have Him do for you? that you give. And there's only going to be one way to know that you got it. We're all going to praise God through. If people aren't praising God through your life, what are you doing? What are you missing? I'm going to give you the opportunity this morning to, to look at it. Look at your life. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe this morning, maybe this moment is your moment to say, Lord, what you can, what you can do for me, you can give me salvation. I'll accept you as my Lord and Savior. I'll work for you. I'll serve you. At the end of the story, before this one, Jesus says, in order to be first, you have to be last. And I came not to be served, but to serve. And if He came to serve, who are we to think we won't serve? Okay, we're here to serve you. In return, you're here to serve others. As you as you get the information, as you know and as you do, to do that. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've given your life to Christ and, and, it's, and you're there. Are you? Are you? Is Jesus standing here saying this morning, what, what would you have me to do so you get it? 
whether it's a first time decision or a decision to get back on with him to, to really say, okay, God, I accept you and then let me truly have vision and wisdom to see and know and do what you <coughs> have me to do. Whatever decision you have as we stand and sing, make your decision. Son's name.